O gracious and loving Father in heaven, we again come before thy great throne. We've just heard uh, the music, uh, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, it is right that we should present uh, not only this little meeting here, but the church at large this morning. Uh, the things that we will learn here, we want to take to, not only to uh, the world, but to the brothers and sisters in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we want to plead uh, the blood of Jesus for the church. And that uh, through his might and his strength, Lord, they will hear a message that will give them a revival. And that they will learn through the uh, prophet Daniel and John, the revelator, uh, the truths that uh, we are to proclaim at this time to the world. We want to lift up before uh, you this morning again, Jeff, Brother Pippinger. Please hide him in Jesus, and may his word, Lord, speak to the hearts of each here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back. Um, we'll start part three. We'll finish off this section of the Time Prophets. And uh, we're talking about dispensational prophets, where we closed out uh, last time, or connecting link prophets. And one brother came up immediately after and said, well, the focus of worship originally was um, when Christ would walk in the garden with Adam. So, yes, there was a dispensation. But the dispensations that we're dealing with in this are the dispensations that take place uh, during the time period when sin is being dealt with. But I agree that the focus of worship at every dispensation is communion with Christ. Um, First, at the gates of the Garden of Eden, then in altars, then in the earthly sanctuary, and then to the heavenly sanctuary. Um, our next uh, quote deals a little bit more with uh, some of the relationships. Once we see how Noah and Moses and John the Baptist are portrayed, and we see that uh, Sister White stands with them, which we're going to get to in a moment, then some of the characteristics that are identified about John the Baptist and Moses are worth considering in the environment of Adventism today when uh, Sister White takes criticism as being the lesser light and so on and so forth. Our first quote is Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 295. The Lord then told them that Moses was greater than a prophet. And we've read a quote earlier where um, John the Baptist was more than a prophet. So both John and Moses were greater or more than a prophet. The Lord then told them that Moses was greater than a prophet and that he had reeled, revealed himself to Moses in a more direct manner than to a prophet, said the Lord within him, will I speak mouth to mouth. Now, I'm sure many of you have been out to uh, St. Helena in California where uh, one of Sister White's residents is. And we, we're from California, so... Often, when our children were young, we would find a way to be in St. Helena on the weekend, and we'd, ha we'd go to Sabbath there, and we'd go down at some point in time and visit Ellen White's home. And I'm not supportive of taking Ellen White and the pioneers and turning them into monuments that are like, like whited sepulchers. Um, but still, it's a very interesting day to go to the Elms Haven home. And often when I'm there, I would, I would stand out, and I'd purposely go out and stand out, and maybe this is just me, but I'd stand outside and I'd look up at that second story room, her bedroom, because there's story after story about people in the evening that would walk by there and there was this purple glow coming out of the room that wasn't being produced by electricity. And they knew from that light that there was an angel up there. there there was a, a communion going on that was unfortunately much greater than the communion that you and I are having um, with our Lord. There was a special relationship between Sister White and the Lord. And, and here we're told that uh, the same was the case with Moses. And Moses, we're going to see, and Sister White are similar type of prophets. But in Selected Messages, Book 3, page 74, Sister White says of her ministry of her role as um, a prophet. She says, I'm now instructed that I am not to be hindered in my work by those who engage in suppositions regarding its nature, whose minds are struggling with so many intricate problems connected with the supposed work of a prophet. My commission embraces the work of a prophet, but it does not end there. 
it embraces much more than the minds of those who have been sowing seeds of unbelief can comprehend. And I would submit to you that when we're told that John the Baptist was more than a prophet, or that Moses was greater than a prophet, that Sister White here is putting on record for those of us that will receive it, that she was greater than a prophet. She was more than a prophet. Her work was more than a simple prophetic work uh, entailed. She was a connecting link prophet. She was the prophet that was used to change the focus of worship from the holy place to the most holy place. And that's why if we go back and look at the early dreams and visions that she recorded, what was the focus during that time period? She was dealing about the transition from the holy place to the most holy place and what was going on in the most holy place. That was the focus of her ministry. She was a connecting link prophet just as Noah, Moses, and John the Baptist was. Brothers and sisters, that's, that's always amazing to me when uh, we hear what we hear about the spirit of prophecy in Adventism today, but when you boil it down in this fashion, look who she stands with in terms of uh, prophetic history. I submit to you she was the prophet to Laodicea. Revelation 3.18 says... I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyesalve, that thou mayest see. Revelation 3.18. I submit to you that we are the people that are living in the time period that is symbolized as Laodicea, and that we have been told we need three things. There's three remedies that Laodiceans need. The ISAV, um, the gold and the white raiment. And you see the quote underneath it, I wanna emphasize here because we're gonna deal a lot with the, the virgins uh, of the parable of the 10 virgins as we continue on in this prophecy school. Please note, this isn't the only place where inspiration says something like this. The state of the church represented by the foolish virgins is also spoken of as the Laodicean state. Now, when you... There are a lot of people stumble over what I'm going to say here. And I don't think you need to, but they do. And I believe it may be because all of us have the uh, ability to hold on to preconceived ideas sometimes longer than we should. But the messages to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3, they have... Several meanings. Some of us get stuck upon saying they only mean history, period. Don't try to apply them any other way. But, but this isn't the case. The messages to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 were messages to churches that then and there existed. They were literal messages for then and there. They were also a symbolic portrayal of the Christian dispensation from the time of the disciples until the end of the world. That's the second thing they were. But if you look very carefully at the writings of Ellen White, you will see that she selects from the different councils of those churches and applies them to God's people at the end of the world. So they also represent God's people at the end of the world. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos. There, there is lessons for all of us to learn from those churches personally and as a corporate group in Adventism today. And most people, because there are clear quotes about the importance of recognizing those churches in their historical symbolism. Philadelphian Church, Millerite Movement, come to the 1844 time period. Shortly thereafter, the next history, Laodicea, takes place. Most of us know that one the most firmly. And some of us are, are unwilling to take any other understanding than that. But I submit to you another understanding that is valid that does not deny all the other understandings is that when the Lord purifies his church here at the end of the world, the foolish virgins will receive the mark of the beast, the wise virgins will receive the seal of God, and their experiences, both classes, are symbolized by Laodicea and Philadelphia. Those people that receive the seal of God, receive the latter rain, uh, you look at the characteristics out, uh, outlined in inspiration for 
who those people, the 144,000 are, and you will see those characteristics identified in the message to Philadelphia. And that's, one of the, this, that's why here, in other places, Sister White reminds us that the Laodicean state also is symbolized by the foolish virgins. But the foolish virgins, the Laodiceans, what we need today at the end of the world are three things. We need gold, white raiment, and ISAV. And, and I'm going to introduce a little bit more about the, phil- uh, the foolish virgins, the wise virgins here. In, in Great Controversy 393, and we're going to deal with this throughout our prophecy school, Great Controversy 393, the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25, also illustrates the experience of the Adventist people. And in Manuscript, Volume 16, page 270, Speaking of the parable of the ten virgins, which is therefore speaking of Laodicea, because Sister White says the Laodicean state is represented by the foolish virgins. So if we're talking about the story of the virgins, we're talking about Laodicea. It says the parable of the ten virgins was given by Christ himself, and every specification should be carefully studied. There are several specifications in the parable of the ten virgins of Matthew 25. There are several of them. But notice, Sister White says we should study every one of them, but then she emphasizes one above all the others. In my mind, that's what she's doing here. She says every specification should be carefully studied. A time will come when the door will. A time will come when the door will be shut. And of course, that's the parable of the ten virgins. And that's also what took place in the Philadelphian church in Revelation 3. And that's also what takes place at the end of time during the Sunday Law crisis. The, the, the bottom line, <laughs> I, 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 was, I had my mind as I was going through this material, I had my, some of my own personal biases that I wanted to put in here for different reasons in this prophecy school. And I, I think it's okay to do that um, as long as you're not changing God's word. But one of the things I wanted to emphasize as we went through, brothers and sisters, there's some brethren in Adventism today that understand that the Sunday law in the United States is where the line is drawn in the sand and that probation closes then and there. But, but, they know that when you tell God's people that, God's people squirm. They don't really want to hear that. So, they have come up with other ways to articulate what happens at the Sunday Law. Now, it agrees with the, with the term, the close of probation, but it doesn't say the close of probation. And what, I'm, what I wanted to emphasize in here is this, brothers and sisters, the parable, the truth of the history of the pioneers, is that there comes a time in Adventism at the end of the world when the door closes, when probationary time is over for the virgins. And it's, it's identified in several passages of Scripture. It's, it's a preeminent part of that testimony. And because of that, I believe that God intends us to say it that way. There's a power in that truth that, yes, it makes us squirm. Because we realize, by the current events, that you can already hear the door creaking. It's about to close. And we're still holding on to this idol or that idol, and we really don't want to hear that, even if we know it's true. But we need to hear that. We need to hear that. Probation's about to close. So that was, that was part of what I was doing here. The, the one part of the parable of the ten virgins that Sister Fry really wants us to understand is that, hey, there comes a point when probation closes on the virgins. Testimonies, volume 9, page 97. Oh, that the people might know the time of their visitation. There are many who have not heard the testing truth for this time. There are many with whom the Spirit of God is striving. The time of God's destructive judgment is a time of mercy for those who have had no opportunity to learn what is truth. Tenderly will, look up, will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is stretched out to save while the door is closed to those who would not enter. If you very carefully look at this this paragraph, brothers and sisters, it's Seventh-day Adventists that have had great light and opportunity. And it's God's children outside of Adventism that haven't heard this message as of yet. And why haven't they heard it? Because we're Laodiceans. We're still sleeping on. But there comes a time period when the door is closed on us 
but it's a time of mercy for those people outside of Adventism. And, and this is, you can establish this truth strictly from the Bible. The Old Testament prophets clearly teach this. It's start, if you haven't seen it, start with the, with the term gathering. Look at the gatherings that go on in the end of the world that the Old, prophets, Old Testament prophets spoke about. There's, there's definitely a, uh, a close of probation for God's people first and then a gathering of those people outside of Adventism. Sister White is the prophet to Laodicea. The remedy for Laodicea is that we need gold, which Sister White defines in several places. Probably the one that we're all familiar with is the one that's on the screen, faith which works by love and purifies the soul. And brothers and sisters, that's a powerful little phrase there. It's not simply faith. It's faith that works by love, and you know that it's genuine love because it's the type of love that purifies the soul. It's not the faith that still is holding on to sin because that isn't really faith, but that is the type of faith that is pretty much proclaimed in the Christian world today. The faith that gold symbolizes is a faith that purifies. The white raiment we need the righteousness of Christ. The ISAV is spiritual discernment. And because we're doing PowerPoint presentations again, I, I, I eliminated my possibility of asking a question I like to ask here before I show the answer on the screen. Brothers and sisters, if you ask usually what is spiritual discernment, usually there's a lot of hesitancy. But what is spiritual discernment? Sooner or later, if you wait, somebody's going to say the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not spiritual discernment. This is spiritual discernment, and this says that we are to test the spirits. This is the foundation of spiritual discernment, the Word of God. Now, you know, I'm not, not trying to attack or oppose the work and role or, or purpose of the Holy Spirit, but when you come down to the bottom line of what spiritual discernment is, it's the Word of God. And that's important to recognize, I think. Because Sister White is a gathering prophet. And based upon all the other times we've dealt with a gathering prophet in this pattern, her name should correspond to her ministry. And the Bible in Psalm 119, 105 identifies itself. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Bible, the Bible is the brightest light of all time. This is what lights our path on the way to the heavenly kingdom. And the word Ellen means a bright and shining light. Her name corresponds to her ministry, and her ministry is to Laodicea. And one of the things that the Laodiceans need is the word of God, spiritual discernment, a bright and shining light. Ellen. Her middle name, Gould, this is hard to find. This is hard to find. I have to tell this story. I, I know all of you probably heard this story, but I'm going to tell this story just for the record. I don't like going to shopping malls. How many in here like going to shopping malls? Don't admit it. Don't admit it. <laughs> I don't like going to shopping malls. And, and my wife isn't really a shopping mall person either, but she, she's more inclined to go to a shopping mall than I. But there came a time when I wanted to go to shopping malls. And the reason for it is the shopping malls in California, they'll always have one or two bookstores. And I could go into these bookstores and I was looking for these books that had uh, names for when you're gonna have a baby. And you wanna go pick out a name for a baby and it you know, starts with A and goes all the way through to Z and it gives you the definition of the names. And I was looking for what Gould meant. And none of those books had Gould. And for three years I looked for a book on names to give me the definition for ghoul because I knew it had to be gold. But I, I, had to have, I had to have proof. I couldn't just, even though I knew it, I knew it because I realized that Ellen meant a bright and shining light. That's, that's the eye salve for Laodicea. And of course, white. I mean, how hard is that? White raiment. 
So I knew Gould had to mean gold, but I couldn't, I just couldn't put my finger on his source. And we, we moved up to the state of Washington to see it, Seattle, and we were outside of Seattle, and one day we took a drive into Seattle, and I says to Kathy, I, I says, they, they gotta have a big library here in Seattle somewhere. And as soon as I said that, here's the Seattle library. So we found a parking space, and we went in, and there's a, several people working there, and I walked up to a, uh, a man, and I says, do you have any um, books on names? He says, come on over here. Oh, we have all kinds of them. And he took us over, and he says, this is, the, this is the best one, and it was a book about this thick of names. I mean, it was bigger than an average dictionary. He says, this is the best one we have, but there were several. And he flipped it over, open as he was leaving to let me do my research, and he flipped it open to Gould. And Gould is an old English name means gold. Her name corresponds to her ministry, brothers and sisters. She's a gathering prophet. Her ministry is life or death. And if we're going to be students of prophecy, we have to understand that. We have to understand that, that the first test for Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world will be a reform test. We'll deal with that later. And the reform message of the spirit of prophecy it's the test that we need to um, come to deal with. White, Revelation 19, we understand that. What's in a name? A bright and shining light. Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet, gold. Now, there's one more part to this. If you're wanting to read that, uh, I'll give you a second, but let's go to the next part. Philadelphia. The experience of Philadelphia. Revelation 3, 8 and 10, I know if you've been an Adventist very long that you realize that the seven churches, uh, beginning at Ephesus and leading, ending at Laodicea, the only two churches that have no condemnation are who? Smyrna and Philadelphia. There's, there's nothing uh, negative. These are people that are uh, doing something right for the Lord. And let's read this. I know thy works. This is the Philadelphians. Behold, I've set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to them to try them that dwell upon the earth. If you were following the first presentation this morning, um, what I was understanding from it, and, I, and I, I understand this is part of what was, what was being led up to in Russell's presentation, is that in 1840 to 1844, there was a binding off going, going on. There was a, a binding in the bundles of... Uh, the foolish virgins and binding into bundles of the wise virgins. There was a separation taking place. Uh, there was power coming down from heaven. The Revelation uh, 10 angel comes down from heaven bringing power uh, that comes from this little book that's open, but at the same time there's a power coming from beneath. And there's two, two classes being formed during this time period, and there's a spiritual battle going on during this Millerite time period. There's a warfare going on that really did go on as this work gets established in history. And as that history is taking place, one of the things that history is doing is it's prefiguring the binding off at the end of time. That in the last days, once again, there is going to be an increase of knowledge during a time period when Satan's power from beneath is coming up and binding his people into his bundles. There, once again, is going to be a power coming down out of heaven that is binding those for the, that are going to be receiving the seal of God. What's the power that comes down out of heaven in our time period that parallels the power that comes down in Revelation 10. <laughs> Revelation 18. Sister White is clear. The angel that comes down in Revelation 10 is Christ. Then who's the, the angel that comes down in Revelation 18? Christ. Christ is about to come down. And during that history, there's two groups being developed. 
And that history is symbolized in the history of Philadelphia. And if you go back and you look at what took place in the pioneer movement with the Millerites, they were in a spiritual warfare, whether they understood it or not. I, 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 I've often, I get to this point, and I always have a story I want to share about Sister White, and I tell myself in my mind as I'm saying it, like I'm telling myself now, I need to go get this story. I know you all know this story, but I don't have it in my notes and my fingertips, so I, my numbers are fuzzy. If anyone's clear on the story I'm going to tell right here, correct me on the number. But if I remember right, Sister White is talking about this time period when she was finally converted and she's going to go out and go to work for the Lord and she made a list of all her friends that she knew wasn't converted and it was like a hundred people, correct me, this is the number I'm unsure of. Anyone remember this story? But It was an incredible amount of people and she went to work to witness to those people and went into the Lord and she won everyone I think except for one. And she's a symbol of the Philadelphian church. They were working for the Lord. They were, they were operating upon the gold. Faith which works by love and purifies the soul. And brothers and sisters, that's what Daniel 12 is talking about. Daniel 12 is talking about the people that go through an increase of knowledge during the Philadelphia time period. And it speaks about a purification process that goes on during that experience. And that's what Sister White says over and over again, that the first, second, third angel's message was a purification process. This warfare that they were involved in was a purification process. It was in the, the act of entering into that warfare that they were purified. And that they received the white raiment of Christ and that they had the spiritual discernment from the Word of God with the increase of knowledge. But one of the characteristics of Philadelphia is that they were the, the Christian soldiers of that time. Do you understand my point? That's what Harmon means. Before she was Ellen Gould White, she was Ellen Gould Harmon. And Harmon means a soldier of peace. Her name corresponds to her ministry. She was the prophet to Philadelphia, the prophet to Laodicea. She's the prophet to you and I here at the end of time. And her message, her ministry, her work is life or death. And in terms of being students of prophecy, and all we're doing here, all we're doing here at the outset is trying to set forth some principles and rules that we can use as we really begin to look at some passage of prophecy. We need to be clear, and I'm sure that all of us are in this room, that the writings of the spirit of prophecy are just as authoritative in terms of prophetic understanding as the Bible. And I'm not trying to set them above them. I'm just trying to put them to where we need to access them with when we're dealing with prophetic subjects. I think I went too far. Select the Messages, Book 1, page 48. Satan is constantly pressing in the spurious to lead away from the truth. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God where there is no vision. The people perish. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. The role of Ellen White at the end of time is so important that this is the point of attack for Satan during this final period of time. And there are so many ways. I mean, when, when you're talking about this, I know you've heard the stories of uh, Adventist ministers standing up in front of their congregation and taking the Spirit of Prophecy books on the Sabbath day and dropping them into trash cans one at a time. You've heard those stories, right? They're true stories. But that's only one way. That's only one way to, to deny or destroy the spirit of prophecy. W what about you and I that have the library full of all the spirit of prophecy books and they just never get opened? We're told we're to wear out the testimonies. How many times do we have to read through a book to wear it out? We're supposed to wear them out. <laughs> How many of us in here have wore out a set of testimonies? Not, I haven't. I haven't. In fact, my condition is, is normally when I go back to the testimonies, I do have a lot of underlining. And they are in different colors where I know I've been there in there at different times. But I'll read it and I'll think, 
Why did I underline that? And I have to, I have to think a while. I, I, it was important at one time and I forgot the importance. There's a lot of ways to make of none effect the spirit of prophecy. It's the last deception. From the, the overt to the more subtle ways. Remember, the Laodiceans are, are the, the virgins, the foolish virgins. Review and Herald, July 7th, 1897. God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications which he sends us. I would submit to you that the spirit of prophecy is some of the communications that God sends to us. God is dishonored when we do not receive the communications which he sends to us. Thus we refuse the golden oil which he would pour into our souls to be communicated to those in darkness. When the call shall come, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. Those who have not received the holy oil, who have not cherished the grace of Christ in their heart, will find, like the foolish virgins, that they are not ready to meet their Lord. They have not in themselves the, the power to obtain the oil, and their lives are wrecked. I would submit to you, there's a lot of definitions of oil that Sister White sets forth. Um, this isn't my favorite quote on this subject. There is a quote where Sister White tells us what the oil in the parable is. And you always ask Seventh-day Adventists, what's the oil in the parable of the Ten Virgins? And what do we all say? Holy the Holy Spirit. But there's a couple places where she defines the oil as character. Character. But here, she's saying it's the communications that come from God that is the holy oil, which is the Holy Spirit but it's also the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Now, one other to be must be communicated to others, but I can't communicate it to others if I don't have it. Um, this, is, this is a point I want to make in this presentation here, these next two quotes, but I, I was, did not know what Russell was going to deal with this morning, and this kind of dovetails into what he was saying, so I'll touch on it a little bit here. There's a purification process from 1840 to 1844 that, among other things, is, is representing the purification process that takes place at the end of time. If you heard Russell this morning, one of the things he said is that uh, this time period, there was a cleansing that went on. And this is a couple of quotes that... Uh, Agrees with that. Crest Collection 114. God's love for his church is infinite. His care over his heritage is unceasing. He suffers no affliction to come upon the church, but such as is essential for her purification, her present and eternal good. He will purify his church even as he purified the temple at the beginning and the close of his ministry on earth. There are at least five places in the spirit of prophecy where Sister White teaches this. There may be more. In not, it's not this quote repeated five times. It's five different quotes. And the second one brings it even more into focus in terms of placing it in the 1840 to 1844 time period in our day and age. This is from Selected Messages, Book 2, page 118. When Jesus began his public ministry, he cleansed the temple from its sacrilegious profanation. Among the last acts of his ministry was the second cleansing of the temple. So in the last work of, for the warning of the world, two distinct calls are made to the churches. The second angel's message is, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 14.8. And in the loud cry of the third angel's message, a voice is heard from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. The two times that Christ cleansed the temple were pointing forward to the second and the fourth angel's message, the two calls out of Babylon, and in the second and fourth angel's message, that's where the church is purified. And how was the church purified in the second angel's message in the Millerite time period? When the second angel's message reached its climax on October 22, 1844, the movement went from 50,000 down to 50 overnight. And when the loud cry of the fourth angel's message joined the third at the Sunday law, we're told over and over again, the majority of Seventh-day Adventists go out from among us at that test. It happens again. And I personally do not believe 
that it will be the same ratio. We would be fortunate if it was the same ratio. In the Millerite movement, it was a thousand to one. I think you can draw a case from the writings of the Spirit of Prophecy and from the Bible that the ratio is going to be greater. But let's use the ratio. Let's lose, use the ratio. If it's a thousand one ratio of God's people that are going to really be prepared for the seal of God and receive the latter rain, then how many of us in this room qualify? That's the seriousness of where we're at. Christ is about to cleanse His temple for the second time. And the, the embodiment of information that is designed by God to prepare us for this purification testing time is in the Bible and in the writings of Ellen Gould White Harmon. She's the prophet to this crisis time period. And this crisis time period is prefigured by 1840 to 1844. And you notice that there's two messages given, there's two calls given to the churches, this last quote said. That's what I was hearing this morning. In the 1840 to 1844 time period, there was a group of people that were carrying Rome. How were they carrying Rome? In their minds, in their hearts. Even those people that were, were what we would call uh, the continuation of the Protestant Reformation. Those were, even, let's make it this way, even the Millerites were still carrying Rome after October 22nd, 1844. Were they not? They were still keeping Rome's mark of authority in their minds and in their hearts. But there's a passage where Sister White says, all the prophecies lead down to the judgment. 1840 to 1844 was the judgment time period. And there was a call given to the church. Rome's been being carried, but you need to come out and be separate. We're going to make two groups of people at this time. The wise and foolish virgins, the Laodiceans, the Philadelphian, the wheat, the tares, the gold, the draws. That's what the Bible's talking about, the separation process. That's what the two temple, two temple cleansing of Christ was pointing forward to. And our safety, our safety, this is, to me, this is one of the most important fundamental understandings of prophecy that we need to understand as Seventh-day Adventists end the, at the end of the world. Our safety at the end of the world is to be familiar with the history of the beginning of Adventism. Because that is where the end of Adventism is illustrated. Jesus always, always, always portrays the end with the beginning. That's why Jesus says, I'm the beginning and the last. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Review and Herald, October 31st, 1899. Many who went forth to meet the bridegroom under the first and second angel's messages refused the third. They continued to carry the woman in their hearts, in their minds. They refused the third, the last testing message to be given to the world. And a similar position will be taken when the last call is made. Brothers and sisters, Sister White here in this passage, she's saying that there was a rejection of the first, second, and third angel's message during the 1840-1844 time period. But that the same thing happens again. We're going to, the, the majority of the world is going to reject the first, second, and third angel's message here at the end. It's another way to understand the repeat. It's all repeated. It's all repeated. We are now at the, the next little section in our, our basics to this prophecy school, which is called the first and the last. Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Brothers and sisters, in chapter 1 of Revelation, I know we've all read that, but I would, I would give you a, a homework assignment in this prophecy school. This chapter is where Christ introduces himself to John and to us. And he introduces us, himself to us in this chapter in order to set down some...
premises so we can understand the rest of the book. He, he identifies certain characteristics about himself in chapter 1 that are referred to throughout the rest of the book. And we've read a quote last night. I think we read it twice, where Sister White says, The Lord does not repeat things that are of no great consequence. And you will find that the one characteristic that Christ identifies of himself in Revelation chapter 1 more than any other is that he is the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. Of all the characteristics that he identifies of himself, those are the ones he says the most. And you will find, if you look closely, if you take... I, let me give you a homework assignment this evening. I, I wished it would happen. It probably won't. Um, start in Isaiah 40 and read the book all the way to the end. Looking for the first and the last. And you'll see that in Isaiah 40 onward, the premier characteristic that Jesus identifies about himself is his ability to identify the end of the world with the beginning of the world. And as you read through that, you'll see that it is that power that he associates with his righteousness. It's that power that distinguishes him from the, the gods of idol worshipers. It's that power that wins the Gentiles outside of God's people to the truth. The, the premier characteristic of Christ, particularly in Bible prophecy, is his ability to portray the end from the beginning. Um, Revelation 1, 8, 11, and 17 are these places in chapter 1 where, that I was referring to. You see it repeated. Um, there is no other characteristic of Christ in chapter 1 that is mentioned as often as him being the first and the last. Look at Isaiah 40, verses 18, 21, 25, and 28. Notice what's being asked throughout Isaiah 40 and onward. These are questions that are, he's trying to make a point for us to understand. To whom then will you liken God? In other words, how are we going to define God? What's, what's God like? What's the definition of God? To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? To whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things? Now, in this passage, he's saying, do you want to understand the Creator? He's, this is one of the themes. He changes themes in Isaiah, but one of them here is, if you, we want to understand the Creator, here's what he's going to say about the Creator. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by their names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from God? Hast thou not known, has not, not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary, there is no searching of his understanding? Keep silence, before me, O islands, and let the people renew their strength. Let them come near, then let them speak. Let us come near together in judgment. Who has raised up the righteous man from the east? Called him to his foot, gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings. He gave them as the dust to his sword, and the driven stubble to his bow. He pursued them, and passed safely, even by the way that he had gone, not gone with his feet. Who hath wrought and done it, calling the generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am He. The characteristic above all other, others that identifies Christ as the Creator is the fact that He's portrayed the end of the world with the beginning of the world. He's called the generations from the beginning to illustrate the end. 41, 20 through 23. 
that they may see and know and consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord hath done this and the Holy One of Israel hath created it. Produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the King of Jacob. Let them bring forth. He's, he's challenging the worshipers of idolatry. This is, this is Elijah at Mount Carmel saying, you guys go first. This is his challenge to, to the worship idolatry. He says, produce your cause. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider the former things, that we may consider them, and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that ye are God's brothers and sisters. He's saying the way that we know he is God is because he can tell us what takes place at the end by what took place at the beginning. He is the first and the last. Yea, do good or do evil, that we may be dismayed and behold it together. Isaiah 42, verses 8 and 9. Who hath declared from the beginning that we may know? And before time that we may say, He is righteous. The righteousness of Christ is established in His ability to do this. Yea, there is none that showeth. Yea, there is none that declareth. Yea, there is none that heareth your words. I am the Lord. That is my name. And my glory will I not give to another. Neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell, the, tell you of them. How does he do that? How does he tell us what's going to come to pass before they come to pass? Through the, through the former things. Through the former things. This is, this is where his creative power is illustrated for anyone to see that would see is through this ability. Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Who among you will give ear to, it, to this and will hearken and hear for the time to come? What's the time to come? The end of the world. Who will hear what I'm going to say next in order to, be, to understand and be prepared for the end of the world, the time to come? Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. And who is I shall call and declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people. Who are the ancient people? Who are the ancient people that are having a role to play today in the end of the world? I'll give you two, just so we're, two simple ones, so we'll be on target. Israel. Israel was one of the ancient people, wasn't it? Who's Israel today? You and I. You and I. There's another ancient person. Abraham's firstborn. Who's Abraham's firstborn? Ishmael. He was one of the ancient people. He's appointed for the time to come. Is Ishmael in the world today? Yes. Radical Islam. Since I appointed the ancient people, he, 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 he controlled the providential history of the past just as certainly as he controls the providential history of the present and the future. And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, be, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time and declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there no God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. Ye, we are his witnesses of what, brothers and sisters? Of his power to portray the end of the world from the history of it recorded in God's word. That's the message for the world. Now in this prophecy school, it's a principle of of prophetic truth that we need to understand, we need to have confidence in, because what we're really focusing on here, at least today, it may go a different direction as we move on, is that our time period is a time period when there's going to be an increase of knowledge, and the wise will understand, the wise virgins, but the foolish won't understand, and the foolish are God's people that will be destroyed from a lack of knowledge. They reject this knowledge. It takes place today. But it was prefigured when? It was prefigured at the Alpha of Adventism in the Millerite movement. And the Alpha was prefiguring the Omega. 
the first, the last, the beginning, the end. Isaiah 45, 1. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed desires, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue the subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two edged the two leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by name, I have surnamed thee. Thou hast not known me, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Who is he speaking of here? Who is he identifying here? In these two verses, these Cyrus? Did I hear someone say Cyrus? Is that who he's talking about here in Isaiah 40, 45, 1? I mean, uh, himself? Is that who he's identifying? Yeah. He says, to his anointed, to Cyrus? And you're going to say that's Christ? No, the, the other part. All right, this is just a flow. I just left some verses out. Okay, but I'm, I'm asking about Cyrus. Is he, who's he identifying, Cyrus? Yes, he is. Is that all? He's identifying us. And he is identifying Christ, too. Cyrus is a type of Christ. And we are a type of Christ. The, all I'm saying is that he's, the, he's one of the ancient peoples that is appointed to portray the end of the world. And that was a, a purposeful trick question that I thought I might draw some people in, and I got Dwayne. It's all of the above. It's all of the above. That's the way the Lord does it. He portrays the end from the beginning. And prophecy is a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. And those events that fulfill prophecy are prefiguring the end of the world. Now, there is a right way and a wrong way to apply those. But nevertheless, it's a figurative delineation. Isaiah 45, 19 through 22. I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare, declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations, that have no knowledge, that set up the wood of their graven image, and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this? from the ancient time. Who hath told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Brothers and sisters, in this passage of Isaiah, when he's talking about Christ's characteristic of being the first and the last, he's distinctly dealing with the worship of idolatry and the distinction between idol worship and his self. What's the idol worship at the end of time? It's that woman that's riding on the beast. The distinction between that woman and the true worship is that God is to be worshipped because he has declared the end from the beginning. 46, 8 through 13. Remember this and so you show yourself men. Bring it again to mind, O you transgressors. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that ex executeth my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, you stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry, and I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Brothers and sisters, we may not qualify. We may uh, get out of the flight pattern. 
Half of you missed a good sermon on Sabbath where there was a story about the migration of birds and the one bird that seen something nice down below and he decided to go down and take a look. And then as the years passed, he'd see the, the birds migrating back to the north and back to the south. And every time they'd call to him and he'd want to go, but he'd got kind of fat and out of shape and he never could get off the ground again. Couldn't get up and get back on track. Brothers and sisters, the Lord's going to finish the work. That's what the Bible says. The world is going to see His glory. It's about to happen. Why am I saying it's about to happen? Because you can see the events that have been prefigured in the Millerite movement are underway. The increase of knowledge from the book of Daniel, it's available. It's coming to light. Now I know there's a lot of voices out there that are opposing it. How many voices were opposing William Miller? Please take a look at this, this uh, chart that we gave you. William Miller, his message was opposed. It was opposed by a thousand different voices. The message is here. The message is here. The increase of knowledge is underway. The two groups are being formed. And Brian, if, if we can't see it living here in the United States with what's going on with the religious right and George Bush and the Congress and the, the mentality of the Americans today, then, then we really are Laodiceans. We're at the end. And because we're at the end, it demands that there be a message that is the message that brings about this revival that God says will take place. It's going to take place. Selected Messages, Book 3, page 338, 339. We've referred to this already. This is so important to being a student of prophecy. I mean, this is the one where it just amazed me there in the Oklahoma meetings that a brother would take this quote and basically say, yeah, the prophets were speaking about the end of the world, but it's just teaching moral lessons. It has nothing to do with the repetition of history. Wow! Each of the ancient prophets spoke less for their own time than for ours, so that their prophesying is in force for us. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Brothers and sisters, your homework tonight, you won't, I won't mark anything off if you don't do this homework, but... Isaiah 40 and onward. And see, see if, you're, if you don't also come to understand that the burden of Isaiah from chapter 40 onward is to lift up Christ's ability to illustrate the end from the beginning. And this is a principle of Bible prophecy that we need to understand. We need to understand it well. And, and we'll deal with it as we're going on. So um, as far as possible now, as we're bringing this one to a close, would you kneel with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that you have portrayed the end of the world from the beginning of the world. And part of that portrayal is that at this time period, you have said that your people would be asleep Lord, we ask that you would awaken us, um, do whatever it takes in our individual experience to awaken us to our personal need of preparation. And then we ask that you'd empower us um, to take a message um, to the world and that you'd give us your wisdom and intelligence that we can give a message that can be easily understood, a message that can draw people to you. And we ask that you'd encourage us because we know at this time there's going to be resistance from a power that's moving from beneath as you're bringing power down from above. Do whatever it takes to make us among those that are called wise virgins, that have the experience symbolized by Philadelphia. And give us a love for the work and ministry of Sister White, that uh, we don't place her above the Bible, but we place her in our hearts and minds that we might um, understand what we should for this time and for our own personal salvation. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.